You're listening to Back to the Roots podcast, along with Brian Wood, and myself, Mike Klein. Today, we are joined by Ted Stutz, who is the owner of Ohio Earth Food, which is an organic fertilizer or inputs company uh, based in Hartville, Ohio. They also have a distribution uh, center in Hillsboro, Wisconsin. And today, we're going to sit down with Ted and kind of get the history of Ohio Earth Food and um, talk about how he works with farmers in uh, multiple states. So, Ted, thanks for joining us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, guys. So, going uh, back to, like, the start of, or your start uh, at Ohio Earth Food, from my understanding is you did not come from an organic farming background. Correct. You. So, what got you, what in your growing up or your early career made you interested in buying an organic fertilizer company? That's a good question. I, um, all through high school and college, I had a lawn care and landscape business. I mean, it wasn't major. I didn't have employees, but, you know, did a lot with soils um, from the standpoint of uh, planting and tearing out stuff and had my hands in the dirt all the time. I, I really didn't know that much about the difference between organic and conventional farming until I bought this company. Um, it's interesting how, you know, fate and life work. Uh, I think that things work out as they're supposed to. I think owning this company is really a perfect fit for me. I didn't know that at the time. I got very lucky, kind of like, I'm not sure about you, Brian, but how Mike and I are with our wives, you know, you're, you're young when you make these decisions and <laughs> You hope it works out as good as it has for, for me, and I think probably you too. Um, yeah, so I mean, I've I'm I'm always been very ecologically minded, you know, um, taking care of the planet. Something that's always nags on me. I can't bear to throw anything away that could be recycled. But I didn't have any idea about how much um, difference there was in organic and conventional. And um, you know, did I buy organic food before I bought Ohio Earth Food? Maybe a little bit, not nearly as much as I do now, but I think that it is an interesting journey that everybody goes through, and I didn't even think about it until you brought it up this morning, that most folks, I guess it's safe to say most folks that are in business like me probably grew up as organic farmers, and that's the way they know, Um, and I didn't, I didn't even think about how interesting that is, and I think that your podcast really could bring up some um, interesting discussions, like individual's journey to the organic lifestyle. Um, and, and I just got back from the fruit and vegetable conference in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I was there all week and that's primarily conventional, but people would come up to the booth and they would talk about how, um, you know, they're not certified organic. They don't have any plans to be certified organic, but they would all say, you know, but I know, you know, it's better for your soil. And, you know, in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, if everybody knows that, why don't more people <laughs> pursue it? You know, I, I, mm-hmm. I, and I think it's my own ignorance, but I can't imagine that hardcore conventional farmers, you know, sit there and think, ah, I know it's not great for my soil, but I'm going to do it anyways. I mean, either I'm missing something or, um, there is this cultural divide that is worth talking about and worth exploring why some people end up on the organic side of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, did you, Mike, did you grow up, did, did your parents always farm organically? Uh, not totally organic. The dad was very organic minded. Okay. And then in the grandpa was diagnosed with Parkinson's. So dad was pretty confident. Ohio state did a lot of research on grandpa and really tried to figure out where it comes from. Dad thought it was from mixing all the chemicals in the sprayer with no mask, no gloves, no nothing. Okay. But he, we still don't know to this day. And dad moved back because he was afraid we are destroying the, the land for future generations. So in probably about 1985 or so, dad completely stopped using any synthetic fertilizers and sprays and then still used antibiotics and stuff in the dairy herd up to about 2000. Hmm. So, but the soil was treated organically since probably, um, just to stay safe, probably 1990. So I, I, you know, um, I just took the certified crop advisor exam yesterday 
And so that's, you know, extremely conventionally focused. I mean, as you know, I'd spent months studying for it and as I'm actually taking it, I thought, <laughs> you know, I, I think it's kind of silly. I learned a lot of this. I'm not going to use a lot of this because it's so conventionally minded, but so much of it is about protective clothing and safe handling and, I don't know if proud's the right word, but I was kind of glad to know that the stuff I sell doesn't require people to have all that training and have all that precaution. And here's how you got to wash the equipment and here's re-entry. I mean, I don't know anything about re-entry intervals because none of our stuff has it. And, you know, it's just like everything else in life. I, I don't think it's it's fair or it's, it, it's too easy to say, or, you know, organic is so much better idea because of all these reasons there's got to be an argument on both sides or everybody would be organic right i just uh um to me and 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 you know back to the journey to organic it just makes perfect sense to me and you know i people that grew up on a conventional farm it, it probably makes perfect sense to them mm -hmm. to farm that way but um yeah i'm not surprised that the growth organic has experienced and i'm actually not i'm kind of surprised it's not been more when I think some of it is that, um, well, we actually had a conversation last night. Uh, we did an episode with Dr. Guy Jadarski and Kevin Kino, and one of the one of the things that they were talking about is organic farmers. Well, you know, Kevin's journey to organic was that he had a kid, and then um, he was storing pesticides in the basement, and he realized that oh, you know, I don't, I can't store this in the basement anymore in a year from now because you know the kid will be mobile and I can't yeah. store these poisons in, in the house anymore. Right. And then he's like, wait a second, you know, I'm putting poisons on food. This is food. Yeah. And I think that's where the disconnect is for some people. Some of the big, large conventional growers is that, um, it's a commodity. It's okay. simply a commodity. And then as they take that journey to eventually maybe be organic or maybe just be more ecologically minded um or um I, bio bio biologically farming i guess mm. i've heard it called you yeah. know it's the next step from organic right um they actually realize that that this this stuff is food for people yeah do you think it's that because the other thing i noticed in studying for the cca exam it's um it's all about and i don't want to insult anybody or simplify it but a lot of it is about yield and that is kind of king it seems like in at least in the row cropping conventional and so i could see how families you know raise their kids it's all about yield and finding the right hybrid and the right mixture of pesticides and um, herbicides to get that yield and i guess if you grow up and that is the goal um a lot of things can be justified, I guess you could say. And and I, I think that the yield, when row cropping, commodity agriculture came, there were the, the animals left the farm. So as long as you were feeding the feed to your own animals, like we were talking about uh, the flowery corns, the flowery corns are much more digestible to a cow than the hard flint type corn. But if you want to ship it in a, put it in a shipping container and ship it to China or wherever, you have to have the flinty stuff or you'll end up with cornmeal when it gets over there. I see. So the, the quality and the digestibility of was replaced with pure yield because that is your income is totally driven by yield and not by quality when it comes to anything that's sold by the bushel or by the weight. And you're not feeding it to your own animals, mm -hmm. so the check and balance is kind of gone. You're not really seeing it. Yeah, I mean that's that's interesting. But I, you know, it's it, so to go back to fruit and vegetable, conventional fruit and vegetable farmers. Um, you know, I guess maybe it's it's still yield driven, um, or a lot of them just express that look, there's no market. I don't get any more on my at my farmer's market or at my produce auction if it's organic. So I don't want to deal with the paperwork or I don't want to deal with the, I think a lot of them don't like being told you can't do this or you can't do that. They don't, you know, they know how to grow. And so I think that's a barrier that a lot of people run into when considering switching over for at least uh, vegetable production. So I think from my viewpoint, I think we'll see organic grain and milk production grow a lot faster than than vegetable however 
I would say only half of my customers that grow produce are certified organic, if that. And that would also include certified naturally grown. A lot of the vegetable growers just, um, and maybe it's because they eat their own products. A lot of them just farm that way because they think it's right or they want to invest in the soil. They may not go through with getting certified or getting reviewed in a certified naturally grown situation, but they, they probably could pass. You know, They use mostly organic inputs and practices. Yeah, I think what was it Kevin mentioned last night um, that, you know, when when you make that move to do it, to grow it the right way or grow it in harmony with nature. Um, the first the first thing you talk about when you talk about organics with somebody is you just mentioned it. You. It's about what you can't use. Right. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. Yeah. And the the. The mindset has to shift to where I get to do this. Uh, it's not what you can't use. It's all these other tools that you can use that are better for everything. You know, possibly they're not going to be better for the yield, but the whole system is going to work better. Yeah, and I, that's a good point. And, and when I go to, I go to a lot of farmers markets because I feel like that's a way I can see customers buy something from them, you know, send some money their way and see what, what's coming out of their, out of their uh, fields, you know, which is neat. And the ones that have the longest lines, the growers that have the longest lines, um, are the ones that have the best products and the taste is best. A lot of them are organic, but I think the lesson learned is if you're, even if you're at a produce auction situation, but certainly if you're at a farmer's market, if that's your route to market, you're in a community and the same people are coming back every week and they're going to go buy the, the vegetables and fruits that taste the best and there's a relationship and there's trust there. And I think whether you're certified organic or not, if the, the, the natural way of growing is producing the most flavorful, nutritious food, eventually that's going to dominate as the, as the way people grow. Um, because it just tastes better and there's more nutrients and, and and the trust factor, you know, I think that they like customers like to see that whether or not you can charge more money for that. I don't know. I mean, you know, Americans have access to an amazing amount of information and they know if you're charging 10 cents more for anything than your competitor. But I think you'll have, I think those growers would all agree that they do have more customer loyalty um, and longer lines and they sell out every week. Uh, the ones that are that are growing in a in a in a way, call it whatever you want, that has better flavor and more nutrients, and um, the customers trust the the grower more. Well, on our podcast, you know, we talk a lot about organic as being the route to better farming practices, and but I would I would one hundred percent agree with you that you don't have to be organic to have a good product, mm-hmm. and that connection, that trust that you make at a farmer's market with a grower that is like, if I go to a farmer's market, I'm looking for organic because I know that they follow practices that I believe in. But if I find somebody that it, that decided to not be organic, but they're growing it in a way that, that is, you know, as Mike said, in harmony with nature and, and balances the soils and they're not using, uh, you know, extreme amounts of chemicals and, and synthetic fertilizers. And now I've made that connection with that farm. And I know that they're, that, that they're growing that good quality mm-hmm. food. Well, I don't need to see the USDA seal yeah. on that, but where it comes in, where that, where the organic label comes in is like, if you're pooling your product, you know, that's where we talk a lot with dairy farmers. And if they can find a way to sell product to a consumer and they don't need to get certified organic, but they're following all the practices and all that kind of stuff to, to, to produce that milk in a, in the right way, what I would consider the right way, then more power to them. Yeah. But the hard part is that, that if you're pooling your product, especially with a, with a produce grower is like, if it's all going on one shelf and, and I don't know whether the tomato I pull off at, at, you know, the local grocery store is going to be from the farm that I made the connection with, or is it going to be from the guy down the road that, that, you know, is intensively chemically farming? Well, I don't want to take, take that risk. 
Yeah, and that, you know, so as I've, I know we started talking about, you know, my buying Ohio Road food, but, and we veered off on that, but I, I do want to say that as I've gone down the, the path, you know, it's my sixth year now, it's really satisfying to see actually customers um, buying our products that aren't certified organic. I mean, I believe in certified organic. I think it's a fantastic thing. But we've got a group of tomato growers in, down south, southern part of the United States, that grow for Walmart. Walmart doesn't care if they're organic or not, but they use all Revita fertilizer because it grows the best tomatoes. And I love that because I know that there's this perception when I tell people I sell organic fertilizer, you know, some people are going to think, and I didn't want this to be the case that, oh, well, you're going to be in business because organic guys have to use your stuff. You know, they're kind of, they're kind of pigeonholed into use. And I, I, you know, obviously don't, nobody wants that for their business. You know, they, we want to be chosen because it works. So, um, I do love to see that even people that don't claim at all to be organic still find that, uh, some of our products do work the best when they're not getting any additional price or are hanging any kind of seal in their window. Um, so is that product, is there just one thing in there that wouldn't qualify it to be used in organics? Oh, it, it's Omri listed. Oh, it, it's Omri listed. It is, yeah. It, it could be, it's just the Revita. It could be used, a lot of these growers could be organic. I mean, I think they, you know, they may have to use a, an occasional pesticide, but they're GAP certified, which is getting closer and closer to being certified organic. They, those guys walk a pretty fine line. But yeah, they use Omri listed products that I sell them. Mm-hmm. Because that's what I'm saying. It grow they they they're growing healthier, better looking tomatoes, and their buyer, which these guys happens to be Walmart, obviously like it because they're they're growing more and more. And you know the word organic's never mentioned, so that's satisfying. I like you know that's great to see. Um, I wanted to ask you guys something. Your what is your opinion on certified naturally grown as an option? I, do you know much about that? I don't know. It doesn't come up much in the milk it. industry. Mm-hmm. in produce there's this thing certified naturally grown and my understanding is that it's the same rules as the national organic program rules it's just peer reviewed instead of you don't have an independent certifier um i wondered if there's any drawback to that or because to me that makes a lot of sense because I, you know back to the reason some people vegetable growers don't want to be certified at least they don't want somebody coming on the farm telling them what they can and can't do and they don't want the cost and paperwork so certified natural grown seems like a streamlined path because it's peer-reviewed and there aren't the costs they have their own logo they have their own website and um, it's big in pennsylvania i learned when i was over there and you can get on their website and see where their farms are not as there's probably only 40 to 50 in indiana ohio maybe 70 in Michigan, probably 150 in Pennsylvania. Mm-hmm. Well, and I guess I, like I mentioned earlier, we, we talk a lot about organic, but I, whatever way gets a premium, maybe it's not a premium, but a way to sell a product in a, in a better way using practices that are better. You know, you said you're in very environmentally minded. Yeah. And I feel that is the, that is the end goal. And mm-hmm whatever route people take to get there it doesn't matter to me mm-hmm. but if they can if if it's better practices for the soil and they're considering the entire system and yeah. not just you know okay we've got a bug on our plant we need to go out and spray it yeah and i feel that's detrimental yeah and um i understand why that system is used but i feel there's better ways to 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 farm yeah and whatever route that is taken to get to that to that road whether it's certified naturally grown whether it's being able to move through more product through walmart because it actually sells because it actually has flavor you Mm -hmm. know like your like your guys down south yeah hey more power to them right Mm -hmm. and i i completely agree and i would throw into that also that i mean if we're being honest with each other americans don't need any more food that's caloric and not nutritious i think Mm -hmm. i think we have a pretty good source (laughs) of unhealthy foods (laughs) i think we got that one locked down and you can just tell i mean again if we're just being honest you could tell americans 
waistline is growing every year. I think that's a big reason. So, you know, along, you know, to go with that. And I don't know what the party line is on if I'm supposed to be out there saying, nope, needs to be certified organic, certified organic. I mean, I don't know, you know, what the right way, but I do know that if people are producing food that has more nutrients in it, you're, you're going to get more out of each bite, no matter what it is, you're going to be healthier. Our country is going to be happier, healthier, and more prosperous. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm all for all of that. Um, I do like, have you guys noticed that certified organic, well, at least OFA, the the certifier in Ohio uh, on their marketing literature now is saying GMO and so GMO free and so much more. I mean, to me, that's an obvious, the, the, awareness of the danger of GMOs has spread like wildfire. And, you know, I've always tried to tell people the only way to make sure it's completely GMO free is for it to be certified organic. I'm glad to see that certifiers are now latching onto that because that's. Well, USDA organic has always been non-GMO. Right. But the non-GMO movement has caught so much traction that I'm a little bit disappointed that you have to point that out. (laughs) Okay. Certified organic is non-GMO, but I think we have to do it because do. the consumer doesn't know the difference. They don't know. I know. And, you know, just stepping back a little bit and talking about, well, it has to be certified. It doesn't have to be certified. Okay, my land is certified. I can raise chicken. I can't sell it certified because the slaughter facility that's USDA inspected is not certified. So, okay. I can't, it's the exact same chicken. They're just not a certified slaughter facility. So to me, the practices that you are doing to raise it is the whole thing. Uh, I think that the USDA certified organic, the guidelines and is an, an absolute must have in production agriculture. The farmer's market one. I don't think it's needed because I'm not, I'm not sure it will pencil out economically for somebody to be certified. However, it's also just because it's at a farmer's market is not necessarily organic. And that's, right. that's yeah, kind that's of a, a misconception good, because right. in some of the bigger cities, the big grocery store chains own the farmer's markets. Is that right? Yeah. Hmm. So I wondered about that because... Yeah, I, they're I getting cut a, out. Otherwise, I you watched know? a documentary, and it I wouldn't ever re- recommend it to anybody because it really made you cynical about farmers' markets. Really, um, I mean, it makes sense because I mean, a grocery store is getting completely cut out of the mm-hmm. loop in a farmers' market, which I don't see as necessarily a bad thing, but I'm sure they do. <laughs> yeah, that is wow. It, it was. It was. I'm little, curious, but was, that's where it all comes back to making that having that trust and that relationship yeah. and making that connection with the person that you're standing in front of at that farmer's market. And I do think we owe a lot of that to the certified organic program. So I, I do think, you know, at least I and should continue to promote it. And because it's done a great job. I mean, mm-hmm. I didn't realize you, certified organic only came around in the year 2000. That's not that long ago. Did you know that? You and, mean Where? In the United States, the NOP rules were, I think, approved by Congress in 98 and the first sort of certified organic farms as we know it, I think we're around the year 2000. Well, we had, like George and them were certified organic, but the NOP rule, so certified organic was around before the NOP. Okay. The NOP was started after that. I see. Okay. As kind of the, would it be the governing body of the yeah. USDA organic program? Okay. Um, I know there were farms certified. The first dairy farm certified in Ohio was in 98. Okay. And that was Mark Martin. Was it? Okay. He was the first certified. Well, I think he was the second certified farm, dairy farm, but the first one that actually shipped organic milk. Okay. Yeah, I know that dairy certified organic was on a different timeline than vegetables yeah. um i think came along maybe a little earlier maybe a little later but what i'm saying is i'm glad you know a lot of i don't think that people would say the same about other federal government programs as they would about usda organic i think that it was done pretty well i think that those rules you hear people complain but 
for the most part, those rules are pretty heralded and people think, you know, that organic, that certified organic, while, you know, it is, it is costly and there's paperwork that it, the rules are, are good and they do separate a farm that's more ecological from ones that aren't. Um, so, I mean, they've done a great job. So we, you know, I, I do want to continue to promote that because without all the efforts to create that, you know, the standard wouldn't be set as high and you wouldn't get things like, well, I think it's a whole other topic, but, you know, I'm not just saying this because Mike Klein's here with Organic Valley, but the fact that grass milk, and I know that's above and beyond the standards, but, I mean, you get omega-3 in milk. I mean, the only other way, I just was realizing how important omega-3 is. The only other source is fish. Mm -hmm. So much easier to get a kid to drink a glass of grass milk than to eat it piece of tuna i mean that's amazing that they're getting that kind of nutrient out of and so you know having these high bars and these high standards you know and i think if we don't all promote the certification of organic then you know that will will break down so um yeah you bring up a good point with just because it's at a farmer's market doesn't mean it's it's organic and you know that does need to be noted even if it's not i like that because that comes with a connection and no, what do you mean? You like like a farmers market setting where oh, okay, you know, the consumer sees the grower, and that's what you don't. You buy a pack of Twinkies at the grocery store. You're never going to have a connection with the person who grew that food, right? Because none of it was grown. Yeah, and it's not food. <laughs> Maybe in a lab. Yeah, yeah. And so, so you're going back to how people like, that don't have animals on their grain farm mm-hmm. don't feel the responsibility, and yeah, so it's, it's because. The connection between the consumer and the farmer is the grocery store, and that is not a good connection. Okay. So I love the idea how the, I think the farmer's market really promotes that connection. Yeah. And I think when people start shopping at farmer's markets, when they do grow, go to the grocery store, they're going to... They're going to think about the connections that they made at the uh, farmer's market, yeah. and it's going to it's going to change their buying patterns and try to be more supportive of the farmers that are doing it right. Okay. Yeah, and I hope, you know, I don't want to, grocery stores are important, and, you know, you hate to see them lose revenue, but farmers are really important, and I don't know one single vegetable farmer that's getting rich out there. So I like farmer's markets because I think they're getting a fair wage for their efforts, Mm -hmm. you know, by by selling it direct there. Plus, you know, um, there's things that, in the food industry happen from the time a piece of fruit or or a vegetable is picked to the time it's put on the shelf um, to minimize the nutrient and the appearance loss during that time. Whereas at a farmer's market, I mean, boom, it's right there. You know, they're not going to be able to cover up some of these, you know, if a strawberry is ripe at a farmer's market, I mean, that means they just picked it. It's ready to eat. You know, if it looks red at a grocery store, there might've been something done to it because it was picked 1500 miles away and has been on a truck for two weeks and anybody that's picked an organic strawberry knows if you let it sit there for a week it it doesn't look like that it does not look like a strawberry yeah so (laughs) well and the other thing too is like i'm just thinking of tomatoes like there are so many different varieties of tomatoes but the ones you find in the grocery store are usually romas or you know the the there's a about four or five different varieties of tomatoes you can find in any different grocery store but at a farmer's market that allows that farmer to try out these um you know maybe an heirloom variety Uh of of tomato and and now there's um, more nutrients in that food potentially if it was grown in the right way as well but you know some of these different colored you know they make like they have uh purple tomatoes and black tomatoes and and um, we were talking last night with dr guy and um, he said, color in food means nutrients. And the different colors mean different nutrients. Huh. And so th- making that connection is allowing the consumers that, that, or the people that go to the farmer's markets to now not only make that connection, but learn about different varieties of tomatoes or carrots or whatever it may be, and just get more connected to what... Uh, what growing food, what that process is, because we've lost a lot of that, you know, as we move into cities and, and, uh, you know, like 
Chicago gets bigger and bigger and bigger population grows and grows and grows. Yep. Um, but we've lost the connection to the farm. And yes. So many people are two to three generations. I mean, I guess we can tie it back to, you know, you had no connection to organics, but now as you've, as you've, uh, learned farming and gotten into the agricultural industry, you've probably learned a lot about the process of growing food. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's important for everybody to know. Because you're right, I think your average American is knows less about growing food than their parents and that the cycle is going the other way. Yeah, you're right. It has been a huge blessing in that regard to open my eyes to it. And that is shocking how much that's changed. When I was at the... Um, Ohio Department of Agriculture yesterday, there was a banner, two banners hanging there that had quotes. One of them was um, something to do with agriculture is our purest pursuit because it brings with it real happiness and honest work and morals. And that was from Thomas Jefferson. And then there was a quote about how important practicing agriculture is to a development of a man and a country. And that was by George Washington. I mean, you know, the, the, the pinnacle leaders in our country back then took time off every summer to farm. You know, I think partially they needed the food, they liked the food, but I think there was this belief that, you know, like exercise or spirituality, that it was a, a character and family developing activity. And I think that that is, you know, gotten... So many Americans would have, you know, have no connection with that. And um, and we're missing that as a country. And, um, you know, I mean, not, not that it's for everybody. And there are other ways to certainly develop your family and your character. But uh, I just, you know, I, I had no idea that that pursuit, that, that getting your hands in the dirt has, you know, so long been thought of as more than just a means to grow food. That there was also this connection, um to the earth and this, uh, you know, character building. Yeah, it's really cool. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that's been that. <laughs> and, and the other thing that I, I've learned is, you know, so my brother and I, we bought Ohio Earth. He didn't have a whole lot to do with it, but we bought some land in southern Ohio and we were growing vegetables on it. We realized how hard it is. I mean, it's really hard. <laughs> you know, you look back and you think, gosh, that, uh, you know, the folks that, 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 farm throughout history um you know they weren't the, necessarily the the phds you know out there they were the the manual labor people but it is hard and gosh i can't believe it's so much and, customers and it gave you an appreciation yeah. for that food mm -hmm. that you grew and then, and then on top of that is it gives you an appreciation for the farmer that now grows yes. your food mm -hmm. and you're maybe now more willing to pay a fair price absolutely uh, for I, somebody that puts in all that work yeah to I, grow something I think everybody should grow a crop that fails agreed agreed and because then we, because if you go out there and you plan something and it's just awesome every year it's kind of like the sports analogy where winning doesn't build character yeah, it is exactly like and that. And if, if your crop is always awesome, maybe you're just that good, but it's that you get so excited and you plant this and then you get nothing. Yes. And it's like now, boy, you notice somebody else's garden and it's just looking great. Like, okay, what are they doing? Because mine don't look like Right. That. Or you go in the grocery store and you see they're selling, I mean, something that's hard to grow, like, you know, leafy greens, a head of lettuce is two bucks. You're like, two dollars and that's after the grocery store market. that farmer probably got a dollar for that i mean that's hard to grow that thing yeah i mean so we are this this first piece of land was an hour away and you know i'd go down there and uh work up the soil and i had one of those at uh, planters that you push looks like a little bike i can't think of what's called i'd plant sweet corn and um put the fertilizer on that i'd leave and be like this is gonna be awesome <laughs> come back in a you know in a week and you know dump some water on it hoe some weeds Come back in a week and they're sprouting up and you're like, all right, you know, I guess. come back in two weeks later and raccoons have torn down all the stocks. It hasn't rained. Nothing's changed. There's like four pathetic looking stocks of corn. I'm just like, oh my goodness, this is tough, you know? So we, we, we said we sold that land and uh, we bought a field much closer so we can keep a closer eye on it because it, it's, it, uh, it's definitely 
not easy to grow vegetables. So, so can we go back a little bit? We we were going to get into uh, wanted to talk about you buying Ohio okay, yeah. food, and we just went down a different trail. But I would like to just step back and and. Where did you learn about a high earth food? What made you buy it? And is your brother also involved? Yeah, no, he's, he's, so my brother values businesses for a living, um, which is a strange thing. Um, uh, to sum it up briefly, people, small businesses are valued by uh, sometimes realtors or, you know, by whatever you can get for it. As you get into medium sized businesses, they're business valuation analysts. So that's what my brother does. Huge companies are valued by you know huge firms in New York and Chicago and the West Coast, but he values middle sized, small to middle sized businesses. And as people want to retire, um, you know, looking at what's the value of this thing, how much do we ask for that? And to make a long story short, Ohio Earth Food was founded in 1973, and the founder Larry Ringer sold it um, in like 2010 to a guy, and uh, this guy. Um, was wanted to run his own business, but I don't think he had any idea how hands-on a small company like this is from the standpoint of, um, you know, n- not just say, I think he just wanted to sell stuff. He didn't realize that, you know, yeah, there's trucks to deal with and forklifts and logistics. And um, anyways, he's he, a couple years later, wanted to sell it again. And so at that point, my brother saw it and uh, that it was up for sale. And it's, it's, it's very unusual that a company that's 45 years old um, is for sale and it's not super expensive because usually after that many years, you're either, you know, grow where you know, somebody like me couldn't afford to buy the company or you, you go out of business. So um, it was, it's, you know, it's still a, a small business and we could afford to buy it together. We, we did borrow money to do that, which we, for the most part, just paid off last year, which was exciting. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just one of those things that, you know, brother's like, hey, you know, we, we'd been looking, we'd been looking. Um, we looked at buying a little ice cream business. Um, I had just gotten out of the military, and I was selling commercial flooring at the time, doing a lot of work with um, schools and libraries, doing state contract flooring work. Um and, you know, it was fun, but it was not, a, you know, a career, and it was definitely not an environmentally friendly industry. They, they do their best, but, I mean, a lot of glue and buckets and plastics, you know, thrown away, and that drove me nuts. Anyways, it just kind of popped up, and I just, you know, we talked about it and, you know, had a couple clandestine meetings, you know, with the owner without, you know, my boss at the time or the Ohio Earth Food employees knowing about it, and it just made sense, so we just kind of did it, and I quit my job, and we bought it, and... Um, here I am running this business. Two weeks later, I had my son. So oh, wow. <laughs> September 2012 was a crazy, I shouldn't just say September. It's basically the next three years were just crazy as I, you know, not only am, you know, er, you know, everybody's run, you know, some sort of business in their life, whether it was in fifth grade and you're selling lemonade, but when you have employees and debt to deal with and suppliers to keep happy and banks to report to and state agencies and workers comp and all the stuff. I mean, it's just extremely overwhelming. On top of that, there was this cultural shift to, uh, you know, I had a Subaru and sold that and bought it at that, that one was a Ford, you know, diesel pickup. And all of a sudden I'm buying trailers and, um, you know, handling chicken manure and, it was a cultural shift because I did not grow up on a farm. And um, anybody that was close to me in those first couple of years would tell you that that was, uh, I don't know if any of you guys remember the term from sociology growing up, they call it role distance and how, you know, if you or I stood out in a runway right now and tried to act like a air traffic controller, you'd feel ridiculous. But those guys sit out there and swing their arms around all day long and they know what it's doing and you know, they've, they've overcome that role distance. Mm -hmm. And I experienced that, you know, I went from, you know, wearing a shirt and tie every day to to jeans and boots and doesn't sound like a big deal, but when you're going through it, 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 uh, you know, it's a little bit emotional. You got to get used to that. On top of that, I was in the military for four years after I got out of college and, um, it was very regimented with time. You know, I had to be places at certain times and it was not negotiable. And now all of a sudden, I don't have to do anything. You know, I own this company. You don't have to get out of bed if you don't want to, if you don't want it to succeed. And so, you know, self-motivation, um, 
all of a sudden became a, a huge thing and, and, uh, managing time and, and energies well. And, um, it was awesome. I mean, looking back, it's, it's the hardest thing I've ever done, but the best thing I've ever done from a personal growth standpoint, from family. I mean, while I'm away in a decent amount, um, it's brought our family closer together because we just realized how important those, those deep relationships are personal faith, um, and, and just personal courage. You know, you realize what you can do when you literally have to do it, you know, when you owe money to banks and <laughs> you have to, have to produce, uh, you, you kind of realize what you're made of. And, you know, I think people get that experience in all different ways in life. And my military career was, um, pretty safe. I never went into to combat in any way. And so I felt like I didn't get, you know, that personal testing there that some folks do. Um, but I do feel like I got it in, in, in buying and running a company. Um, so, you know, that was, that was terrifying and, uh, stressful, but, you know, really satisfying having come out on kind of the other side and, um, you know, having grown the company and, retained employees and uh great employees and uh paid off debt and that's been, and all these things we talked about for the last hour you know learning about this you know agricultural world that is you know i think very noble and um especially the the organic part of it so um lucked out in a lot of ways you know i think it easily i could have bought a company and you know six years down the road been sitting here thinking and this industry is kind of a mess you know <laughs> what did i do and, and and been sitting there thinking, this industry is not going anywhere. You know, I just bought a. I was gonna say buggy whip company, but maybe I shouldn't say that. In Northern <laughs> that, Indiana. <laughs> that one might actually be a really good company to buy. Yeah, <laughs> in business school, that's kind of the buggy whip is kind of the the famous thing that went out of you know, bought a buggy whip company because. But the, hey, you know, a lot of my customers own buggy whips. So yeah, did you did you see when you first bought it and. You're going out and meeting these farmers and trying, you know, trying to sell your product. Did was it harder to sell since you didn't have the background in it? Yeah. Since since you were new to it and it took you some time to actually believe. Not saying that you were didn't believe in the company, no. but to believe that this product is actually working. Was it hard to sell until you actually believed it? Super hard. Um, and, and customers knew it. Um, and the guy that bought a high earth before me, the bought a high earth food before me was the same way. He didn't, he, I don't remember what his background was in. He was a chief operations officer for a large company in Cleveland. And yeah, so not only did the customers, I think, know that I didn't have an ag background, they knew that the guy before me didn't. And I think they'd started to lose faith in the business. Honestly, um, I had some farmers tell me, you know, that, you know, that company had a, a good long history, but had been floundering a bit um, back in 2010, 2012. So it was kind of to your benefit that he kind of, it it didn't, you said floundering. Yeah. So it floundered flounder for a couple of years prior to you buying it, which was a benefit to you. So the the yeah. company didn't start dipping after you bought it. it never the, did dip. The sales okay. never actually went down. Um, I, and I think that is because the founder made some really good decisions on what products to carry and what products to make. Mm-hmm. And the products were really good. And they were carrying the company. Um, is he so still involved? He, uh, he, if you get our catalog, he's on the inside. And that's um, he has no. He, he owns the building. We rent the Ohio branch from him. And Jordan Ringer, that is the manager of the Ohio branch, is his grandson. But he has, other than being the landlord, he has no involvement. Um, I asked if I could put his picture in, inside the catalog just because so many people ask me how he's doing. So many people ask me how he's doing because he had good relationships. And I he's doing great, and he has had some medical challenges. And so his Cynthia, his wife, uh, who was just as involved, and everybody talks about Larry and the company, but Cynthia was just as involved. Um they're both doing great and are healthy and happy. And I wanted to show people that he's actually getting an award at OFA this year, a life, okay. kind of a lifetime achievement award. And so I put that picture in there just, just, uh, to, you know, to kind of pay homage to him and what he did for our little company. Um, but it's interesting when you buy a company, the seller and buyer relationship is extremely important. 
and it's it's um uh, you know they have so much to teach you and you have so much you need to learn but there was somebody in between me and Larry mm-hmm. the other buyer and he didn't really know that much and so I would see Larry a lot because he owned the building and he he farms the acres around the building and so he's in there all the time and I would ask him questions and he didn't you know, have any financial or otherwise to, to answer them or to take time to help me out um, other than, you know, he, he probably wanted to keep, you know, us as a tenant in the building, he wanted to see the company go on because he started it and he wanted to see, you know, a good place for his grandson to work. But, um, you know, there was no contract between him and I, and that's, was really, um, I don't know what the word is, but it, it made it really hard for me because I didn't have anybody to go to with these questions. You know, his grandson, Jordan, that runs our higher branch helped out. He would be who I went to. He did a great job, but I mean, when I bought the company, he was 21, you know, he's a young guy and, um, I didn't, you know, I just didn't really have anybody to ask things mm-hmm. is the bottom line. And so Larry would jump in there and he would tease about charging me and I would <laughs> tease about paying him because money was very tight. Um, I think I maybe did a couple of times cause he was so helpful, but, um, you know, and looking at it now after owning it for six years, you know. I think about it all the time. If I ever did sell this, I would have I would want to spend every waking minute of a year or more with the guy that bought it because there's so much to teach him, and there really wasn't anybody like that for me. I had to literally figure it out a lot of it on my own just by trial and error, and that's why those first couple of years were so stressful. I felt like I was you know running on a hamster wheel a lot of times, just doing things were not efficient uses of time. And um, but you know you get through it. What do you do? Uh, but yeah, that that that's 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 a if you ever do anybody ever does look into buying a company, I would say that um, your relationship with the seller is crucial because you have so much to learn from them. No matter how think how smart you think you are going into it or what mm-hmm. kind of business or otherwise school you've been to, there's so many little industry specific things to learn, and that relationship. You know, it starts with a big financial deal, and then from there, it it uh, you know it's got to turn into a, a friendship because you just you're really dependent on the, the seller. But mm-hmm. You guys looking at each other because the vacuum cleaner, right? <laughs> yeah, nice background noise there. A music bed. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, the um, the one thing I wanted to ask you guys about, getting back to organic standards, do you think that some people think that that needs to be increase and tighten to prevent what we're seeing with milk and i know mike you know a lot about this but with with milk being sold by um some of the big box stores that maybe they need to have tighter standards put on them to make sure it's going to have the same nutrition and that it's not going to dilute the quality of organic reputation well this is a little bit of a tricky one (laughs) but probably its own podcast i don't don't think we need to go into the organic standards and try to change the organic standard because you're opening Pandora's box if you do that. Okay. But I think there needs to be enforcement of the rules that are in place. And I think there's a there could be lacking in it's lacking in the enforcement of the rules that are in place and if people abide by those rules, I think we're good. But anytime you're dealing with human beings and rules and regulations, they're going to find places that they can loophole or or work the system. Uh, And I think the 30% grazing rule is the biggest one that needs to be enforced. So that is being, I mean, it's proven that that's being ignored? No, it's not proven. I would not say ignored, and it's not proven. Okay. It's just a lot of theory. Suspected. The the big concern is that, that the organic industry whether it's dairy produce chickens doesn't matter that the big companies the big growers the big farms are going to take over okay and then all of a sudden this price premium that's there that can help sustain and keep a small farm in business is suddenly going to go away because now these big farms can supply the big box stores with cheap organic milk it follows the standards I mean, they're certified organic. They have a certificate. And some of them certainly are meeting 
dry matter for grazing on a dairy farm and or if it's a produce farm or a chicken grower they're they're following the standards but um it it kind of goes against the the spirit of the organic mm. system yeah and that is the big concern and i you know i don't know if it's a if it's an nop change that's required i don't know if anything's needed to change that it's um I still think it comes back to the connection that the consumer has, tying it back to what we were talking about earlier. It's the connection that the consumer has with the product they're buying. If they do their research and find out that, you know, the company that they buy their that they buy their eggs from is supporting small farms, well, I hope they're more willing to pay a little bit of a price premium to support that. Mm-hmm versus supporting large farms and you know maybe in the end money will talk but i i don't think that's the case because the big box stores they want the cheapest product that they can put a label on Mm -hmm. that they can put an organic label on right so just in conventional dairy in 2016 1725 dairy farms went out of business in the united states goodness and we have more cows now than we did then so when these small dairy farms are selling out, those cows are not going out of the system. They're going to the big farms. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, Brian, you mentioned, you know, the big farm coming into organics is really scary to the small farmer, and yeah. rightfully so. Sure. Because you cannot compete on an efficiency level of the big farm. Right. You know, the I think the big farmers want... 1.5 to 1.8 million pounds of milk annually per employee. We've got a lot of small farms in here in the Mid East that have 500,000 pounds milk annually, and it is a whole family effort. Mm-hmm. We're talking four or five people to make that half a million pounds of milk, where they're expecting three times that per employee. So we we can't yeah we can't compete. If we're playing the same game, so we have to differentiate ourselves with, and organics does that with grazing, and and I think, I mean, I don't really think anything needs to be drastically changed. I think the system is in place. The system can work. I just think that that we need to market the spirit or the the whole systems approach of organics needs to do a better job of promoting that part. Well, and and if you know if all else fails, I mean the nutritional benefits like your guys like Organic Valley's grass milk. Mm-hmm. I mean that's got to be really pushed. Mm-hmm. You know, you wonder if Americans will. Right now, there's a big movement for local, and I hope that's real, and I hope that that sustains. I mean, that's hugely important. I mean, if you read a lot of the, which I haven't a lot of it, but I know a little bit about the, um, you know, the communist and socialist manifestos they think that in capitalism if left to its own devices they'll end up with you know two huge companies owning everything and uh, because of economies of scale and that you could see how that would happen i think it already is happening and has happened for the last 100 years um so is it enough for americans to want to buy local um to keep these businesses you know i i don't know you know but i i do i'm glad to see that that there are tangible um nutritional benefits you know like i like the omega-3 in grass milk that's huge that's huge differentiator there and hopefully americans you know realize that um because unfortunately you know you hate for there to be a battle of a large company versus small company but you know i mean the the, the, the stock market and uh there's no or very little um influence on those prices of social awareness, you know, and of environmental friendliness. And, you know, those leadership of those companies that are public, their responsibility is to the shareholders and to the owners of that company to raise the price. That's what they have to do. And unfortunately, you know, I don't think that, you know, social awareness and, um, you know, care for the little guy really affects people's buying decisions for stocks and what's going to drive up the price. So, they're just going to do what looks best to their investors, you know. They kind of have to. You can't blame them. But well, and it definitely makes things look a little, you know, pessimistic. But 
yeah. in all reality. I think that's part of the reason why we're all in the org, you know, the agricultural industry in general and organic is for, for me really exciting to work with because you do see these small movements yeah. of, of, uh, of people that want, you know, a good quality product from a farmer that they know, you know, the, yeah. the know your farmer movement or, and also the, you know, the back, let's just take a, the backyard chicken movement for lack of a better term, you know, all kinds of people, including myself have half a dozen chickens in yeah. the backyard and they might live in the middle of the suburbs of Chicago. Yeah. But is that where you live? Have, no, that's not where I live. Oh. But you know, that's you'll you can drive through some of these big cities, and you'll see in the backyard, you'll just catch a peek of a chicken coop yeah. in the backyard, and a few chickens walking around yeah. in the backyard, and that's that's kind of exciting. You know, that yeah. that's cause for optimism to me is that yeah that, and then also a, a small garden right next to there. You know, that people are growing a few of their own. Uh, you know, pickles and tomatoes and stuff that they that they put in work, like we talked about earlier, putting their hands in the ground, yeah. and seeing that and knowing that that to me means that people want a connection with their food. Yep, and they 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 know about better nutrition because those eggs and those little small chicken are better than anything you could buy. Mm-hmm. Delicious. And I think if you look at like a, a Blue Apron, where they're sending okay. out the just the ingredients you need to make a meal because there is a movement back to cooking and baking and if you do your own cooking and baking you're going to start realizing and seeing the difference between good food and cheap food and i shouldn't say all cheap food is bad that's not what i'm saying but you'll start noticing because you're working with it so yeah very possibly well these eggs i don't really like these eggs so we're going to get a couple chickens then you're going to get a tomato plant. I think st- it starts with an interest in your food, preparing yep, yep. your own food, and then it it can go backwards. Yeah, or right. it can start with seeing a farmer at a farmer's market and talking right. to him, and then it goes, well, I want to try this in the kitchen. Yep. I want to try, you know. Yeah. So it, it, I think it can go go both ways, but just working with the food somewhere along the supply chain, yeah, should get you interested in it. And, and you're right, and the things that are going to bloom off of that, you know, all of a sudden, eh, do I want to put this chemical on my lawn? How important is it to have a green lawn when that's going to roll right down into my tomato garden? Um, and, and things like that. Dandelions look beautiful on the lawn. <laughs> yeah, right? Are they really that bad? You guys seen the movie The Lorax? Yes. I mean, it, it just nails it. I mean, it, it's a little, it's a cartoon, obviously. It's make believe, but a community that just gets boiled down to no trees and no nature because of how difficult they are to clean up and interesting a lot of parallels there and it came out right when <laughs> right when i bought a with oh, really? food and you know i'm sitting there trying to watch it with my kids and my mind is going to the 10 million things i need to be doing and i'm like this is really what's at the heart of this movement you know and people are like you really like this movie don't you buddy <laughs> <laughs> so i have talked probably more than you wanted are we at, no. a, at about a time limit here yeah yeah we can wrap her up yeah. and and uh yeah if you just want to maybe give us some background you know tell us a little bit about where people can find yeah. ohio earth food and find more information and all that kind of stuff yeah i appreciate it very much um so we were uh founded the, the backbone of the the company um is a little catalog and it still is little and um not flashy and we try and get them into as many folks hands as we can We um, try to sell directly to farmers. We do have some dealers and distributors, but, um, you know, we were founded just selling directly to farmers and just having what farmers need, you know, um, if their soil test says they need something, we have it that can be used for organic. If you need uh, a foliar spray, a granular fertilizer, you're transitioning and you have equipment for conventional, we have stuff that will work for certified organic, um, and so we just do all we can to get it into folks' hands. You can buy it through our website. Uh, we have a branch in Ohio and Wisconsin and trucks at both of those locations that deliver right to farms. Uh, we can send it on a semi if it's more affordable. Um, you can come pick it up, you know, just whatever we can do. We're kind of an old-fashioned business in that regard and that, um, you know, we believe in connections with people. And um, that's what I, this time of year, I'm, all sales and then come March I, I get in my 
Diesel will pick up and put a tr- gooseneck on the back and I deliver because I just want to get out and see folks and uh, keep costs down for growers uh, because I know that they've got plenty of other costs to deal with. Um, as far as a product, uh, we did, uh, you know, I know, I would imagine that a lot of grazers listen to this, a lot of the grass. We, <laughs> uh, we did a test and it's in our catalog this year, the details this year, uh, this last year with the, the settlages, which are an organic valley family in St. Mary's, Ohio. Um, they set aside 30 acres and we tried um, five different products on six acre plots each. And Jordan, their their son, he just got out of the military and he's um, you know into testing things and into improving his techniques. So we donated some products and he tried a couple different techniques for fertilizing grass. It was mostly grass, a little bit of clover. There's no alfalfa to speak of. And um, it's interesting in there to see you know, what, what returned his investment. The whole thesis of the test was the best way to fertilize for $50 or less. And on the different results, we not only put, you know, we had a control, we put what increase in pounds of hay from the control and then dividing that by the cost, how much hay increase from the control did they get per dollar spent on each of the techniques? And then what was the change in relative feed value and crude protein um and you know it's it's pretty interesting to see that you know we did a granular option two foliar options and a mycorrhizal fungi application to see what the results of that were and you know we sell all of them we weren't trying to make anybody look good or bad you know i just wanted to know and prove you know what worked the best to help people make decisions they're getting into this you know what kind of equipment should i buy a sprayer or spreader and um you know, it wasn't a perfect test, you know, uh, but uh, I, th- I do think that there's some things to be learned from that. And we're going to continue to do that that kind of thing to try to um, put hard numbers to different products to make decisions easier for growers on what to buy, you know, as they continue to get squeezed on price, you know, what what what's effective use of money for inputs. So um, anyways, that catalog is available at, you know, lots of the trade shows we go to. You can call our Ohio, our Wisconsin branch, and ask one. We'll mail one to you. You can download it from our website. Um, you can buy products from our website, but the, the quantity discounts for ton ton lots won't be visible because you can't set up freight through the website. But, um, yeah, that's that's kind of the how we go to market is, you know, a lot of people mailing in orders the old-fashioned way or calling in. And you are going to have a booth at the Moses organic farming conference in lacrosse we are yeah we big trade show year this year i picked up two new ones that fruit and vegetable meeting uh that i just did last week in um hershey pennsylvania was new and then we're going to be at pasa uh this next week which is in state college pa then ofa the ohio certifiers in dayton ohio the following week then moses that next week yeah, a lot of miles on the road for for Ted, um, but that's fine. I love doing those shows. Um, so yeah, we'll have booths at all of those different shows, and um, we do the grazing conference in Ohio. We're going to be today at the grazing conference in Northern Indiana, and um, yeah, love to have people come out and you know meet them and hear what uh, we can possibly do for them. Yeah, and, and you had mentioned something if if they hear about you on the podcast to mention it when they talk to you and you'll give them a discount or something to see if actually anybody that listens buys stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So they're, uh, yeah. At, at, uh, at any of those, at any of those shows, um, if you mentioned that you heard us, yeah, we'd give you a uh, 5% off of any purchase, which that would include ton lots, which are, you know, highly discounted already because of the quantity. So, um, that's about all I can give out is five percent. So that the <laughs> and maybe some. Which was the one that really works for p- tomatoes? <laughs> I I need some fertilizer for my tomatoes because I have problems with them. But that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a couple yeah. different things that can work. So, well, Ted, Great. thank you so much Absolutely. for taking the time and sitting down. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, me too. And thank you guys for doing this and for inviting me. I'm I'm honored, and I think that. Uh, um not very often do i get to get into a deep conversation and hopefully you know people that hear this can 
learn something about it and, and, you know, whether they're a producer or they're a consumer, you know, get out there and, and, and buy some stuff from these hardworking organic farmers. Thanks a lot. Dave. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, guys.